This is the main product by a company named Electric Glass Mars Solutions. The company had the big vision of entering the electric vehicle market before it went bankrupt in 2022. Their product was an electric delivery van, which was supposed to be the first of its kind in the Class 1 electric vehicle segment. Instead of wanting to directly compete with large car makers, of which there were many, they wanted to be the first movers in a very specific niche. Their main customers were supposed to be other businesses, which were in the delivery space and were operating large fleets for last mile deliveries. Last mile delivery basically just refers to the final delivery spot, which is usually in urban areas where the efficiency is quite low. Examples of potential customers in the space were FedEx, Walmart or Amazon. After a 294 million spec deal and reaching a 1.4 billion valuation, they ended up filing for chapter 7 bankruptcy, which basically means full liquidation of the business. They had hundreds of employees in the US and a production facility ready to produce 100,000 vehicles per year. The CEO, James Taylor, and Chairman Jason Liu were very confident in their vision. So let's analyze it, see if it was predictable or if it was just bad luck. Electric Glass Mars Solution was founded in 2019 in Troy, Michigan. After operating privately for a few years, they announced a SPAC in 2020 and went public in June 2021, which provided them with the $294 million in cash. In a 2021 press release, the CEO said, In the second quarter, we successfully closed our business combination, providing us with sufficient funds to execute our business plan. This sounds great, right? But they kept burning cash, which you see in their financial statement. As an early stage startup, this is normal, but if your company's main selling point is fast execution, the first mover advantage and low cost, then you're expected to reach revenues fast. They did manage to gain some revenues in the last reported quarter, but much of the data that should be available for 2021 is unavailable. They went bankrupt in mid-2022, but the required annual reports for 2021 are completely missing. So why is that? They had some troubles. Some executive, including the CEO James Taylor and the chairman Jason Liu, bought up company shares back in 2021 at a discount right before announcing to go public in September. They ended up being investigated by a special committee. They were also late in publishing their quarterly results, which is in violation of the Nasdaq listing requirements. They then both decided to step down from their positions and abandon ship in February 2022. Just a week later, the auditor resigned as well, and then only a few weeks after, they ended up filing for chapter 7 bankruptcy. So why did it turn from being on track to be the first and having strong demand to a full-on company crash? This is the CEO and co-founder of the company. He is talking about what is different about their technology. The product is different, as you can see behind me. Uh, we'll be entering a so-called class 1 space as the only entry in this uh, electrified delivery market. And this uh, e-commerce explosion, let's call it, of uh, demand on the last mile deliveries, but a huge amount of pressure on the delivery companies to come up with economical solutions to that. And uh, we'll be unique at the bottom end of the market here where they're looking for low cost, highlight low cost, reliable, and as our name says, you know, last mile delivery solutions. You said the market's pretty crowded at the top end and even the middle with some new announcements, but we'll be the sole first mover in, in the bottom of this space. Competing on price is always tough. You're basically hoping that you can enter a very capital intensive market with a low cost product and beat large competitors on price. They're betting on launching a product quickly, which basically means that they want to enter the market and scale with a minimum viable product, because this is what you're going to have if you try to develop and launch really, really quickly. The problem is if they can develop the car that quickly, then there's no reason to believe that large manufacturers can't just do the same. The core selling point is low cost Cost, but cheap is always a tough sell since it's often a trade-off with quality and it also often requires scale to be profitable especially when it comes to hardware intensive businesses like car manufacturing also they didn't even quantify the savings here calling a 30 percent larger storage capacity a commercial differentiation from the clearly abundant alternatives also seems like a stretch Higher value chain costs are not a good thing for them. If you compete on pricing, then that means your margins will be really slim and you depend on raw materials being low cost as well. This is especially true if you don't have the sales volume of a large competitor and you don't have the trust of suppliers as a well-known component buyer. I have no clue why they thought this was a good idea to earlier.
A model that many startups pursue is to buy finished components from suppliers and simply assemble them. This is very common, but there's a danger that if the assembly step is too simple or involves no intellectual property at all, then you can be easily pushed out of business. This doesn't mean that you have to manufacture everything from scratch, but you should be mindful about how important your role in the value chain is. We'll be using existing, reliable hardware platforms, parts from an existing OEM that's already in market and running today allowing us to get to market much faster, but also at a much, much lower cost than the other EV startups. So all in, we have a, a different business plan. It's a unique approach. They're basically purchasing everything and are assembling it. This is fine, but again, it can be a problem, especially if semiconductors are suddenly more expensive and in short supply as they started to be in 2020. Yes, you can say that the whole model was flawed in hindsight, but the shortages started before they even announced the spec, so they knew about the problems. The cost of batteries, expensive semiconductors, they were definitely aware of the risks. They only have two real technology differentiators which are price and cargo space, while the rest are derivative like volume per mile or commercial like warranties. I have no clue why they didn't even show their own price here. If you compare the pricing to competitors and actually give a number for the competing price, you have to give a number for your own price as well. This is the one you actually can know. Sometimes you don't know competing prices, but you should definitely know your own price. He said it in the interview, it's about 32,000, whatever. Just adding a check mark in your pitch deck seems kind of odd. And they have some strange side businesses like upfitting vehicles and then vehicle data. They seem like a big distraction and maybe were designed to give investors some add-on reasons to invest like hey we have all of these other businesses as well but it doesn't seem too aligned with their strategy it's kind of in the same area but it doesn't really seem too aligned with what they do day to day if the main selling point is that you are a cheap bottom of the market solution so why do you need the data collecting infrastructure why do you have the upfitting workshops this just seems like a distraction we'll also be applying custom data suites connectivity suites as well as upfitting converting that plant from a hardware standpoint so that the ultimate end use uh, of that customer is exactly what they need uh, for their specifications. If the upfitting, which is basically a customized workshop, was easily scalable, then it could be a really good idea to generate cash just on the side until your main business is profitable. But it sounds like it needs a lot of manual work and customization. Also, the customers that would be looking for cheap upfitting might not be the ideal target group for the main business because they probably don't want to buy a whole commercial fleet. They just want to upfit a few vehicles. So this is why I say this could be a big distraction. The data part sounds kind of interesting because I'm always a fan when it comes Company just makes use of what it's collecting anyway if for example it's collecting a lot of data but there are so many companies working on IoT and autonomous driving so I have no idea why they think they could add value to this they're still at the point where they kind of have this minimum viable product as a vehicle but they haven't really fully designed it yet because they kept saying that design is something we're still going to do so then to even think about data as an add-on I would first fix the design have the finished product and then you can think about data but at this point it really seems like something that is just designed to additionally convince investors. And also dealing with the whole data infrastructure, privacy and IT, it seems very unnecessary for companies that is really just hardware manufacturing, which is their main business. Just get into all of that and then hire expensive developers seems a little bit much. They filed one patent, but this doesn't sound like a huge barrier for competitors because you want to have patents that kind of protect your market so people just don't come in. But then of course the patent should protect your core IP. It should be something that's completely redundant like Theranos did with a finger warmer like completely meaningless patents but their patent is kind of related to crash protection as far as I know this is the only patent they actually applied for yeah and they were too dependent on their suppliers and it's really hard to identify what is unique about them and why they are the ideal company to enter the space why are they important in the value chain are they just assembling something they buy from China or do they have unique IP unique connections to make this business work actually no we have a unique business relationship we've established contracts with uh, OEMs who already have these platforms uh, in the market running so we inherit their proven reliable products systems uh, parts all the software that comes to us we adapt those for the US situation specifically the safety systems that have to pass US compliance and as part of that uh, transition from the uh, parts that we have coming into us and the ultimate integration uh, we build those in our plant in Indiana and send those to our final customers. The advantage of using an existing platform rather than starting all new is it literally saves hundreds of millions of startup cash as well as gets us to the market much faster in less than a year uh, compared to the typical three or four years. 
they clearly didn't own their own technology. And here's a quote from the SEC filing of the second quarter of 2021. Until such time as, and if, we develop alternative sources of technology, platforms, subsystems, components, and or parts, we will be dependent on our existing and new arrangements with third parties as a source of the underlying technology, platforms, subsystems, components, and or parts to be used in our urban delivery and urban utility vehicles. They mentioned that they licensed others' technology, but it was likely not an exclusive deal. Licensing is also always tricky because this means that not only do you not own your technology, you are also borrowing it from someone else. And the bigger your business grows, the less leverage you will have when it comes to negotiations because you have no other choice but to license. And they heavily relied on only two manufacturers from China to supply all of the components. So their model was basically to purchase components from China, assemble everything in the US, and then win the market through 30% more storage, low cost, and the non-existing brand, which is obviously a super flawed model. But they already knew all of that back in June 2021. Here's a quote from the quarterly report. The ELMS vehicles are designed for use with and are dependent upon existing electric vehicle technology. As new companies and larger existing vehicle manufacturers enter the electric vehicle space, we may lose any technological advantage we may have had in the marketplace and suffer a decline in our position in the market. However, our products may become obsolete or our research and development efforts may not be sufficient to adapt to changes in or to create the necessary technology to effectively compete. So what's the point in being the first to market if you already know that your tiny boat is going to be crushed by the huge boats as soon as the large competitors are going to come into the market? It's important to us as a new brand, you know, earn, earning our reputation for the beginning and making sure that the, we hit all of our quality gates and you know, that's something that's normal in auto companies to have those uh, discipline and uh, focus on the execution at the detail level and uh, gain our respect with our customers. So we want to launch at the appropriate rate through the uh, fourth quarter. Every startup always has to build brand from scratch and especially things like reliability will take a long time for customers to assess. They even acknowledge this in their written report. We may not succeed in establishing, maintaining and strengthening our brand, which would materially and adversely affect customer acceptance. To compete on brand and cost seems like a contradiction. It seems like one of these things where you have to pick one. Or you're really lucky and you can be in an industry where the cheapest thing is also the highest in quality or has the best brand. Usually the thing that has the best brand has the highest quality and usually the thing that is the cheapest has the lowest quality. Of course there can be exceptions but I don't think cars are the exception to that. If you want to have a really strong brand like BMW or Volkswagen or Ford then you need to make sure that you have really high quality and this means it's probably also going to be a little more expensive. Quality and brand doesn't always have to go hand in hand but I think when it comes to cars cars, it has to go hand in hand. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that the car industry is already super competitive. Why is it that all the failing startups keep saying the same things? This is an untapped market, which means there's no competition. I will be entering this uh, small van, uh, short delivery, so-called urban delivery with our initial vehicle this fall. So far, there are no other announced entrants in that space. So we'll have uh, all white space and get uh, early first mover status to grab some share. White space basically means that they have no competitor in the market. They say they have a clear differentiation and that they are the only EV player in class one, two, three and urban use cases, which sounds like they're not really seeing the competition as a threat. I agree. There's a super competitive market coming now uh, forward in the EV space, uh, especially GM and Ford's uh, huge announcements for their commitments. But we have a different uh, approach to this, Phil. Let me go through a few of those for you. First is we are a pure play commercial electric vehicle company, meaning we're not in retail and commercial, strictly in commercial space. That's different than the others. Uh, second, we're launching into an empty part of the market, white space, down in the electric van, uh, so-called class one. No other competitors announced uh, from the legacy manufacturers or the new EVs. So they sell B2B, they're the only class one vehicle and they are fast and cheap. So the fact that he's saying that they're buying existing technology is already a red flag. Because what are you investing in? What is the unique IP that they own? They clearly are competitors. The vehicles shown here are not electric, so I'm not sure why they included them on their main competitor slide. Here are a few examples of electric vans that were available in 2021, but two things. First, if the vehicle is cheaper, then I would definitely put a number on this so that it can compare 
compare and see if it's a significant improvement or not. Don't just say lower or higher, that's just too vague. Second, the 30% more cargo space doesn't seem like that much of a differentiator since this should be very easy to copy for competitors. And who says that each vehicle will always be at 100% space usage, especially when it comes to last mile deliveries, which are notoriously inefficient. The load is going to depend on the need in the area, the routes. So I would expect that the vans are below full capacity most of the time anyway. And if it needed more capacity, it could make sense to just buy a larger vehicle. You know, the demand, they're looking for electric products, as you know, with the extremely high pressure for them to achieve their commitments for green, for sustainability, for credits. And there's nothing available in this bottom end space. We're not competing with RJ, with Rivian. We're not competing with Lordstown. We're not up at the high ends of these other uh, products that have entered the large, say, UPS uh, vehicle space. So at this point in time, we're alone at the bottom in the price point that uh, we'll be offering our customers. We are alone at the bottom is kind of the worst quote a CEO should say. We are alone at the bottom. Even if you mean that, yes, you're competing on price, which is perfectly fair, but to say we are alone off the bottom is kind of a horrible sentence. But you can see that they really think that this differentiation would have been enough. But in their report, they have to actually list the risks and are much more transparent. They acknowledge the intense competition and also the name recognition of the competitors. I don't know if you remember, but the world was ending back in 2020, which was the year ELMS thought, how about we go public? This was the time when the world came to a full stop, supply chains were frozen, and things like semiconductors were in short supply and expensive. Obviously, there's never a good time to start a car company, but it's very competitive and very capital intensive, and this made it much worse. So did they really just have bad luck? Was the pandemic the reason why they didn't succeed? In the third quarter of 2021, they announced that they had have secured a 6,000 unit order commitment. Although it's hard to say how secure this was at the time. Definitely not money that's in the bank. Uh, we uh, translate that to reservations, hand raisers, you know, early indications of interest to make sure it's clear. These are non-binding. However, I think it's a great indication of what's going on in this space. If you look at uh, not just these pre-orders, but look what's going on. We have the current administration uh, promoting the movement towards the space. We have very large companies like FedEx and the package delivery making uh, aggressive claims as well their conversion ratios. We have states like California who already historically been aggressive, but even more aggressive about their mandates and conversions. And many large public companies saying with their ESG commitments and move towards uh, more of a carbon neutral environment. So all that is the backdrop for why there's uh, significant demand in this space. Whatever. Maybe they had thousands of orders, maybe not, but they clearly did have some revenues in the last report. Here's what the CEO announced in Q3. We are thrilled to have achieved our scheduled milestones this quarter. Most notably, generating revenue from the successful launch and delivery of the first class one commercial EV in the United States. But in the same report, they also said, in light of unprecedented global supply chain challenges, we have made the strategic decision to revise our production target to 300 to 500 vehicles for 2021 and deliver the remaining orders in Q1 of 2022. They also said that they have to build the whole charging ecosystem, but let's not get into that. Here's why they would have failed global apocalypse or not. They stopped posting quarterly and annual reports in 2021, which was in violation of the Nasdaq listing requirements. Why? The CEO and chairman were being investigated for buying cheap shares right before announcing the SPAC deal back in 2020. As a result, they both ended up resigning in February 2022. That's always a bad sign. If the CEO steps down in a startup, then that usually signals some deeper problems. A week later, the auditor quit as well, so that's why they entirely gave up on finding annual and quarterly reports. Remember, this was all caused by factors unrelated to semiconductor shortages or whatever else was going on. This was a questionable stock purchase and an SEC investigation and the resignation of the founding team. Of course, the company struggled to stay afloat and investors avoided them like the plague. Who would want to invest into a company with a questionable business model that can't even follow the basic listing requirements? But do you remember how they boasted after the 294 million SPAC deal? How they had sufficient financing to execute their business plan? Suddenly they changed their tune to, we cannot produce unless we raise money. I would love to hear the story behind that one.
wrong. So something must have gone horribly wrong on the administrative side before we could even see what would have happened to the tech when they go to market. Because could it have worked? Of course, there are many companies that purchase components, assemble something and then sell it because they figured out a good business model. But this company, we didn't even see if this could have worked. And no, it wasn't the pandemic that was the cause. It was what happened back in 2022 when they bought some stock they shouldn't have. So what are the big lessons we can take away from this 300 million downfall? Number one, get your administration right. You can't be in violation of listing requirements if you're a public company, especially if you depend on funding and must maintain a good reputation for investors. Also make sure that the SEC never has a reason to investigate your management team. Honestly, this shouldn't be that hard because they didn't even investigate Bernie Madoff and he had the biggest financial fraud at the time. Number two, you must own the technology that you're using, especially if you are the first mover. If you have no IP at all, depend on licensing and buy all components from China, then there's no reason why your competitors can't just do the same and push you out. Number three, competing on pricing is great, but if you are a startup with limited funds, then your ability to put pricing leverage on large companies is very limited. Chances are that your competitors can subsidize their own products and make them cheaper until you are out of business. So make sure that you can actually hold the lowest price and that the price is low enough for customers to take a bet on you, especially if you have no brand. Number four, there can always be bad luck. The apocalypse might come at any time and in any shape or in any form. When I was in Germany in early 2022, wheat flour became scarce. Not because it was actually in short supply, it was just a perception that was propagated by the news which prompted people to buy more. And in the supermarket you were actually restricted. They only allowed people to buy one pack of flour just because of the fear of the people who are buying more than they actually need. It's the same with Australia and toilet paper back in 2020. Once you realize that bad things are happening, you have to adapt to it quickly and maybe pivot your business. By the way, don't watch the news, it's just being voluntarily manipulated at this point. Alright, thanks for watching.